Uh, good morning, everyone, and it's lovely to see you, uh, to see you all here. I look forward uh, to the day. Populism in and of the EU. What I will try to do is unbungle populism and the EU by looking at it from three lenses, but predominantly the first. That is the EU as a target of populists, populists within the gates or at the table, and the EU as an arena of populism. But there are three features of the EU as a political order that I think we must keep in mind uh, as we discuss this. The first is the nature of the EU as a polity. It's a compound polity, and it's a polity that has extremely strong and robust multi-level governance. All we have to do is look at the policy output of the EU, the legislative output, its capacity to govern different policy areas. But that's not matched by multi-level uh, politics. Multi-level politics is much weaker than multi-level governance, and that's partly because uh, of the next uh, argument I would make, and that is that in terms of legitimate politics in Europe, national politics remains preeminent. It is the arena of politics that matters most to people. Turnout in national elections is always much higher than in European elections. Uh, and if you look at the way in which uh, national media, they look at national politics uh, much more carefully than they do at European politics. And, uh, and this is Hans Peter uh, has researched on this very actively, European politics has become politicized, the EU itself has become politicized, but again, in a very constrained way. And in a, a paper I'm doing, a, a separate paper to this, I'm actually arguing that the EU suffers from uh, a politics gap. Uh, the second feature that, uh, of the EU that should be kept in mind is that when you look at what the instruments of governance are in the EU, it is usually driven, it's much stronger on in terms of rules and law. And if you remember back in the early uh, 2000s, the argument that it was integration through law uh, was one of the predominant features of the EU. Also, uh, negative integration. The EU spends a lot of time on telling governments what thou shalt not do, what they can't do, rather than what they can. And that, again, uh, has an impact on the, way in which, uh, on the way in which the politics of this system work. Equally, uh, it, in terms of the resources of public, uh, of public power, any national government in Europe is spending between 36 and 50% of the gross GNI of the country, whereas the EU, as we know, is still a 1% budget. So what, we come to th what we've come to think of when it comes to governing uh, as power, the EU has very thin financial capacity. And that affects both its output legitimacy, but also its capacity to respond. It affects what it can do in response to the problems on the ground. And we saw this uh, very forcibly during the, um, during the financial crisis. So again, just to sum up, resources in the EU, the capacity of the EU is, in public finance terms, much weaker than in rules. So then on to the EU as target. If populists were to dream of a polity that they could attack that didn't exist, it would be the EU. It is the ideal target for populists. Everything about it means that it is something that uh, populists find difficult. Firstly, it is in, to its core a centrist political project. Support for the EU has always been much stronger at the centre than at the extremes of the political continuum. It's an inverted U-curve. In order to achieve things in the EU, you either need unanimity or supermajority. So it's a very consensus-driven system. It's not an adversarial system. It's a consensus-driven system requiring compromise to its core. It is a series of bargains, always bargains, unending bargains, never finished bargains. And of course, if populists like the world to be simple, the EU is anything but. It is complex both in substance and in its procedures. 
And there's often the argument, well, why can't the EU have a nice short constitution like a, like a member state? 10 pages, 12 pages. It's because governments and member states want to know what the rules of the game are in extreme detail. It's a question of trust. The EU polity could not sustain a constitution of the kind that animates domestic politics. It really does need the, the complexity that goes with the uh, treaty structure. Of course, then, expertise and knowledge. There's a premium placed on the role of knowledge and expertise in the EU system. The Commission is a, a it's constantly looking for what is the available knowledge, who are the experts, how do we drive these complex policies onwards. And for example, I, this week alone I was exposed to what the EU does in terms of air quality. So the EU Air Quality Directive sets out the targets. It just doesn't set out the targets. It says what member states must do at domestic level in terms of governance. Not only that, but those agencies at domestic level that uh, monitor air quality must deliver the results of their monitoring to the Commission constantly. But beyond that, and this for me was the surprise, the member state agencies that engage in this their equipment is tested regularly to see that they're not cheating. So they have to bring the equipment that's being used or inspectors go there to make sure that there's no cheating. And the outcome of, uh, the, outcome of the actual testing processes is not public, but the governments all know who does a good job and who does a less good job, and there's all the peer pressure. And so that is replicated right across the range of public policy. And of course, if you want decent air quality, you've got to have expertise, and you've got to have knowledge, and you've got to have responsible agencies. So that, again, is something that allows the, uh, the EU become a, a very easy target. And of course, there is always the Washington Beltway in the US, the Brussels Beltway. Brussels is over there. It is distant from domestic politics. It's distant from uh, domestic, from the capitals. The EU can also be very easily mobilized as the other. The logic of uh, populism, as we've heard already, is the elite versus the people. There is an authentic people. Populists are of the people, but not of the system. And the EU has been driven by domestic, political, and economic elites. Uh, their purpose was to reduce boundaries, to increase competition, to increase mobility across border, and even to use the symbols of nationalism. There, is, there are symbols of the playbook of nationalism is being used at the EU level, the flags, the anthems, the passport covers and all of the symbols that tell us we are both national and European. For an awfully long time, the European flag was simply something that prime ministers and foreign ministers stood, had it behind them when they gave their press conferences. But what we saw both in the recent past is we've seen the flag being used as an instrument of politics, both it being burnt during the, uh, being burnt during the, um, the financial crisis and used as a symbol for remain in, uh, and it's, uh, I don't think the United Kingdom has ever displayed as many uh, European flags as have been displayed uh, since the referendum. They're everywhere. Uh, and of course, populists also like simple political messages and one of the most effective simple political message of all time uh, is take back control. So the EU, is, can be mobilized as the other. And again, if you look at how populists talk about the EU, you see the tropes that are there. Failed political union, disaster zone, utterly out of control, human misery on a shocking scale. That's the language with, with which Farage describes the system. And of course, the very frequently you get populists uh, comparing the EU to the Soviet Union. That is quite, a, and it's, when, it, when you find uh, 
when you find foreign ministers of countries beginning to do this, then you really know it's taken over, but that's very frequent. A, a quote from Le Pen from the 2017 election, what is at stake in this election is the continuity of France as a free nation, our existence as a people. I mean, nothing, it's primordial, it's existential, it is the battle between us, the patriots, and the globalists, or the, the EU. So the tropes are there. I'm not going to say much about this because I know it's the, uh, Olivia uh, will speak about it, but I do think we need to separate out populism and Euroscepticism. They're distinct but interconnected. Populism is not confined to Europe. As we know, there are populists across the world. And Euroscepticism is not always populist. The European, European integration is a political project. And one should expect, as with any political project, that there would be opposition to it. I find opposition to the EU. For me, the surprise with Euroscepticism is not that it exists, but that it took so long to emerge. Uh, so Euroscepticism uh, and uh, populism, we need to be careful that we do. Mind you, populist parties tend to be Eurosceptic. In fact, all are Eurosceptic. Uh, we also need to uh, think about how party competition uh, feeds into both populism and Euroscepticism, how Europe is used, how it's mobilized, uh, the, uh, the way in which whether parties are less are more Eurosceptic in opposition and what happens to them when they, when they assume governmental power, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, uh, I think that we apply the term Euroscepticism across too broad a range. I think there are Europhobes there for whom everything about the EU <laughs> is something to be opposed. They see, and, and we see a lot of Europhobia in action. I would regard Nigel Farage as a Europhobe, not as a Eurosceptic. Um, I won't say anything about this because, again, I'm mindful of the time, and we have a, we've excellent speakers, uh, but I do think that populism, uh, the pop, what characterizes this period of European governance is populists are at the table. They're in government, at the table, and as we know, uh, in a number of countries, challenging core European values. But I won't say any more about that or that. Then finally, the EU is an arena. Uh, I think one of the things we have to think about is, does the fact that the European Parliament is directly elected that the stakes are low in European Parliament elections, that they're second order, does that generate a wonderful arena for the populace because it's pretty cost-free to register discontent at the European Parliament elections? You get very low turnout, and the challenger parties have all got a lot of money, and they go to Brussels for the money. They don't participate actively in the committees. They tend not to be active European parliamentarians, but they're extremely active in signing up, collecting the check, and using that at domestic level. So we have to think about, does this offer a, a platform for anti-system parties that then translates into domestic politics? And I am of the view that Brexit would have could not have happened had, uh, European, had the European Parliament not been directly elected because UKIP could never have got traction in domestic politics in the United Kingdom because of the electoral system. So again, I just leave it there, the EU is an arena. We know that uh, as the European Parliament elections since, uh, since 79, that in each, of the, in each of the successive elections, you have much stronger representation uh, of the uh, Eurosceptics uh, in, the, in the Parliament, and of course that squeezes the dominant parties of the centre, but also drives them into these uh, grand coalitions, which then leaves political space to the left and right for, for the populace. So I think, I'm, am I very close to... You, you're fine, you still have one, two minutes. Okay, so where, where are we now? Well, 2016 was the populists emboldened Trump and Brexit. Then with Macron's election in 2017, the threat is over. It's not. 
populists are more successful across Europe now than ever before. 15% with enormous variation, but it's, it has increased. And of course, as Hans Peter will, will, will talk to us about, there are deep underlying structural shifts in politics uh, that mean that the populists are here to stay. And of course, there's also that phenomenon, the decline of the central left of social democracy, both ideologically and institutionally. But we also have the Europhiles. Uh, Macron was uh, willing to argue for Europe in the election. He has subsequently, as uh, we know, the, uh, he talks about Europe, he, he uh, defends Europe. Uh, Jörg said that your, your national politicians don't. Macron does all of the time. But the question is, is it enough? Uh, if we reduce the battle in Europe to Orban versus Macron, uh, is that what the battle is at the moment in Europe? Or is it much more complex? And I think uh, it's much more complex. I think output legitimacy for the EU continues to matter. Uh, there has to be a dialogue with European peoples about what governing means in the 21st century, about borders, community, mobility, and globalization. But what's important at the moment for the EU systemically is that there is a living experiment on the continent in what it means to untie the ties of interdependence. And by that I mean Brexit. And looking at how complex it is and how difficult it is and just how deep the interdependence is across this continent, then in my view, national closure is the route to decline. So closure is not an option. Countries can opt for closure but there are costs in closure. So the question is, how can interdependence be managed in a way that it's not just interdependence in terms of the multi-level governance, but also then uh, the multi-level politics? Thank you. Thank you very much.